Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. be with you. you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great Grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. The word of the Lord. The psalm appointed for the second Sunday of Easter is Psalm 133. We will say the psalm together in unison. Oh, how good and pleasant it is when brethren live together in unity. It is like fine oil upon the head that runs down upon the beard, upon the beard of Aaron, and runs down upon the collar of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon that falls upon the hills of Zion. For there the Lord has ordained the blessing, life forevermore. A reading from the first letter of John. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testified to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. 
And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is, is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The word of the Lord. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. 
If ye retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. In the name of the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I'm really glad you did come back. I mean, I know it's not quite the crowd that we had last week, but boy, what a, what a wonderful day. And, and what a beautiful day today is, too. So thank you. Um, for being here on what is customarily known as Low Sunday in the church. Uh, you know, a lot of churches, uh, when Easter's a little bit later, it's like shut down time. It's like the last Sunday school classes, everything ends. But it's only the first week of April. I mean, the Masters hadn't even started yet. <laughs> we got to keep going. And that's a good thing. And so here we are, those of you who have come back to hear the rest of the story. Someone reminded me that, oh yeah, you said that last week. We all came back to hear the rest of the story. And I was like, what story? <laughs> That's what moving all my things from South Carolina to Virginia this past week will do to you. It feels like it's been a year since last Sunday, but, um, but it's only been a week and so the rest of the story goes like this. So Mary Magdalene had gone to the tomb that morning, saw the gardener, not knowing it was Jesus, recognizes Jesus when Jesus calls her name. She has this back and forth with Jesus where Jesus says, don't hold on to me, I haven't ascended to the Father, but go back and tell them. So she goes back and tells them. And then what? Well, the story picks up exactly where we left off last week. So you might recall on that same day. So this is still Easter day, according to the gospel story, even though it's the day that's been a whole week for us. But nevertheless, here we are. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week. Now, we do get to the following week, but we begin the reading when it's still the same day as our reading from last week, Easter Day ended. Seeing, believing, and reconciliation are the key topics for today's message. I have about 15 minutes on each. <laughs> Not quite. 
close, but not quite. Now, in our reading from the 20th chapter of John, there are many references to seeing and believing. And maybe not so obvious in the text right away, but there's many references to reconciliation as well. On that first Easter day, as the disciples are huddled together, hiding in fear behind locked doors, Jesus comes to them. Mysteriously, he appears out of nowhere. He says to them, peace be with you. And they said, who let you in here? No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Sorry, did you ever notice the doors are locked and he just appears to them? They must have been astounded. He says to them, peace be with you. And then he shows them the marks in his hands and his side. And after seeing this evidence, they are convinced that it is really Jesus, and they respond with joy. Now, seeing and believing are important components of this resurrection story, but I think even greater is the teaching about reconciliation. When we look at this story more closely... We see that Thomas, Thomas, who gets a bad rap, is not really that different from the rest of the disciples. They too needed the visual proof. It was necessary for them to see the mark of nails in his hands before they could rejoice and believe that Jesus was risen from the dead there in their midst. I mean, the only difference really between Thomas and the rest of the disciples is that Thomas just wasn't there on that first day when Jesus appears to the disciples. And so when they go to tell him, without Jesus being with them, what could you expect? For all he knows, his dear friend, his teacher, is dead. And he spells out the requirements for what it would take for him to believe them. Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. (coughs) Reconciliation. Reconciliation has to do with setting things right. It's the mending of something that's been broken. It's the mending of relationships that have gone wrong. We all know something about this in our lives. You all are a part of a family. And that usually means being involved in some form, we hope, of reconciliation. Reconciliation is a word we rightly associate with our faith and with our relationship with God. It's it's central. One of our sacraments is the sacrament of the reconciliation of a penitent. The liturgy is in the prayer book on page 447. In case this isn't interesting enough, you can look that up, 447. It is an interesting thing that people don't really realize about who we are. But it's part of who we are. And not just part. It's essential to who we are. If you were to look in the outline of the faith, often called the catechism, that's way in the back. I haven't memorized that page number, but it's way in the back. It'll talk about what is the, what is the key purpose of the church, and it talks about reconciliation, the ministry of reconciliation. In addition to the gospel reading. I was struck by the wording of the collect today, the opening phrase, Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation. Our reading from Acts describes a community that practices reconciliation, much to the dismay of capitalists and those who think the dollar is the most important thing, Not that all capitalists believe that. I'm not anti-capitalism. But this whole idea of everybody shared everything, they gave away stuff, everybody got what they needed, it was based on that. 
That is a model of reconciliation in so many ways. Our reading from 1 John, the second reading today, talks of seeing and believing before it continues with a teaching about reconciliation and forgiveness. It's all over the place. St. Paul, who we didn't hear from today, but who is responsible for most of the material in the New Testament, Paul knew everything about reconciliation. His life was a model of what it means to be reconciled to God. Practically every one of his letters deals with this on some level because he's dealing with communities. He's dealing with relationships. He's dealing with Christian families. Reconciliation is needed. This passage from the second letter to the Corinthians is central to what I'm really talking about and central to who Paul is, was. Paul wrote, If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 20. I believe that the message of reconciliation is woven through the entire canon of Scripture. And it's certainly a major part of what is happening in today's gospel lesson. It may not be apparent at first, but every year, on the second Sunday of Easter, we hear this same reading from John's gospel. We pick up, no matter what gospel version of the resurrection we've heard on Easter, second Easter is always John chapter 20. And we know this story as the story of doubting Thomas. And yet, it's really been misnamed. Unless we just always judge people on how they first presented themselves to us. We don't give people a chance to make a different impression. Well, if we did that with Thomas, we would just call him Doubting Thomas. But I'll explain. The scene opens with the disciples scared and hiding behind locked doors. Suddenly, Jesus comes and stands among them and says, Peace be with you. Shows them his wounds. Disciples rejoice at seeing the Lord. But Thomas is missing. He was not there on the first Easter. We don't know where he was. The gospel is silent on this point. We just know he missed out. He missed out on Jesus' initial appearance to the disciples. And maybe that's where I should have picked up on stick around, stay around, because that's what I kind of talked about last week when Mary Magdalene stayed at the tomb and was able to then see Jesus sticking around. Thomas wasn't sticking around, but we can't blame him. I'm sure he was grief-stricken. But here, Thomas, the one who said, let us also go that we may die with him. He's missing. The other disciples tell Thomas about seeing Jesus risen from the dead, but he wants none of it. He insists on seeing with his own eyes. Now, perhaps the strangest thing about his absence is that it doesn't seem to matter to anyone that he wasn't there. It's not as though the other disciples are like, <laughs> you missed out. Sorry, you're really not one of us. Might use uh, the phrase, uh, he's in okay. You know what in okay stands for? It's something I learned in my last church. Not our kind. And not, not what, I take that back. I didn't learn it at the church. I learned it living in South Carolina. But it's, it, it's anywhere. It's not just there. It's, it's here too. So maybe Thomas could have been dubbed as, hey, you know, you didn't have the same experience as us. You're in okay. Nevertheless, the amazing thing is he's welcome back. He is there the very next week. 
It doesn't say anything that after passing their test of belief, Thomas was with them. It doesn't say that Thomas begged to be accepted by them. It just says the next week the disciples were gathered and Thomas was with him. I love that. Whatever rift may have been caused by his refusal to believe them seems to have had no bearing on his being counted among them as a full member of the group. Now, that's the Episcopal Church, right? We don't ask you, do you believe exactly like you, and do you believe like me, and if you don't, you can't be a part of it. I love this model of inclusivity and of tolerance and of acceptance and ultimately what leads to reconciliation. So Jesus appears out of nowhere again. Peace be with you without hesitation. Jesus says to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt but believe. And believe is just what Thomas does. Thomas's belief moves him to say the greatest proclamation in all of the Gospels. No one else says what Thomas said about Jesus or to Jesus. He makes a profession of faith so bold and certain that any doubt left in his mind or in the minds of the others as to who Jesus is will be wiped away. And Thomas answers Jesus, my Lord and my God. No one else says that. No one else has such a powerful proclamation, acclamation, reference to Jesus. My Lord and my God. All of the disciples had in some way deserted and denied Jesus in his time of pain and need. And yet here he is appearing to them a second time, seemingly for the purpose of bringing Thomas on board. Jesus wanted all of them to believe he was willing to do whatever it was necessary for them to have faith, to come back even in the same way. Not because he needed them to have faith, but because he wanted them to have faith. Jesus wants us to have faith. With faith comes hope. With hope comes love. And with love comes reconciliation. Jesus was showing them how much he loved them. By appearing to them, he was willing, he was telling them that it would be all right. Even for Thomas, whose absence and disbelief would have been grounds for rejection by the others, Jesus is demonstrating for them a model of reconciliation. Jesus makes the first move toward reconciliation. Jesus always takes the initiative. God always takes the initiative with us. And here he is reconciling the disciples to him after their betrayal, after their denial. He comes back to them. Thomas saw the signs of Jesus' reconciling love in the wounds left from the crucifixion. The disciples saw the reconciling love of God when Jesus brought Thomas back into relationship with him. We see the reconciling love of the disciples when Thomas is welcomed back in their fellowship and community. This is the model of ministry we are to practice in our lives and at St. Paul's. The examples of Thomas and the other disciples points towards God's love for us. Jesus is calling us to this ministry of reconciliation. Let us, let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal Mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation. Grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.
standing and turning to page 358, let us profess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Father the Almighty, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people are form three, beginning on page 387. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we all may be one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world that there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. We pray this day for the quiet repose of the soul of Mary Jane Hubbard. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign, now and forever. Amen. Please rise. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. And please share a sign of peace with those near you. Welcome again, welcome back. It's good to have you, or welcome for the first time, 
If you're visiting us today, a very, very special welcome. It is great to have you here, and we'd love to get to know you better. And one of the ways you can help us do that is by filling out this yellow card in the pew rack. And um, there were a good number of these that came in last week. And uh, I think I said I probably wouldn't be in touch with anybody Easter week because I was indeed moving um, a lot of stuff. <laughs> and, you know, moving is just, it's just not that much fun. But professionally speaking, it was a great experience um, for the company that uh, I was able to, to use. And uh, so I'm settling in um, to that far off place of Roanoke City. So don't worry, I'll be around a lot. Uh, but anyway, um, I hope you all are doing well and that um, you'll notice in the bulletin, there's not like a ton of announcements there. Just one thing that jumped out to me was that SPA, and SPA stands for St. Paul's Adults, uh, are having an outing at the Green Hill Park. And I was curious as to I didn't know, you know what we were going to do down in the park. I know they used to play polo down there some years ago, but uh, fly a kite, I didn't know. And then, and then I heard, oh, food trucks. <laughs> oh, of course, it had to have all food. It's 12.30 this Thursday. Come get, meet us down there at Green Hill Park, and uh, we'll enjoy the delights of whatever food trucks happen to show up. Um, one other announcement is um, the beauty of the lilies and all the other flowers uh, were tremendous last week. And now we have lilies that need a home. So if you would like a lily, come on back to the coffee hour, which you all are all welcome to. Come throughout this service through that door. And take a lily, plant them. They will probably never bloom on Easter again. But they do bloom if you keep them going. They're perennial when they keep coming. So I've done that before. I can tell you. I have seen it, and I believe <laughs> the lilies do bloom. <laughs> I'll stop, I promise. All right. Yours, O oh Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. Everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours, O oh Lord, is the kingdom, and you are exalted as head over all.
Eucharistic prayer D is found on page 372 in the Book of Common Prayer, page 372. I'll be uh, chanting the Sursum Corda and the preface through the season of Easter. The Lord be he with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right to glorify you, Father, and to give you thanks. For you alone are God, living and true, dwelling in light inaccessible from before time and forever. Fountain of life and source of all goodness, you made all things and filled them with your blessing. You created them to rejoice in the splendor of your radiance. Countless throngs of angels stand before you to serve you night and day. And beholding the glory of your presence, they offer you unceasing praise. Joining with them and giving voice to every creature under heaven, we acclaim you and glorify your name as we sing. Mighty works reveal your wisdom and love. You formed us in your own image, giving the whole world into our care, so that in obedience to you, our Creator, we might rule and serve all your creatures. When our disobedience took us far from you, you did not abandon us to the power of death. In your mercy, you came to our help, so that in seeking you, we might find you. Again and again, you called us in the covenant with you. And through the prophets, you taught us to hope for salvation. Father, you love the world so much that in the fullness of time, you sent your only Son to be our Savior. Incarnate by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, he lived as one of us, yet without sin. To the poor, he proclaimed the good news of salvation. To prisoners, freedom. To the sorrowful, joy. To fulfill your purpose, he gave himself up to death and, rising from the grave, destroyed death and made the whole creation new. And that we might live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and rose for us, he sent the Holy Spirit, his own first gift for those who believe, to complete his work in the world and to bring to fulfillment the sanctification of all. When the hour had come for him to be glorified by you, his heavenly Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. At supper with them, he took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, 
And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Father, we now celebrate this memorial of our redemption, recalling Christ's death and his descent among the dead, proclaiming his resurrection and ascension to your right hand, awaiting his coming in glory, and offering to you from the gifts you have given us this bread and this cup. We praise you and we bless you. We, we praise, praise you, you. We, we bless you. you. We, we give thanks to you. And we, we pray to you, you, Lord our God. Lord, we pray that in your goodness and mercy, your Holy Spirit may descend upon us and upon these gifts, sanctifying them and showing them to be the holy gifts for your holy people, the bread of life and the cup of salvation, the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant that all who share this bread and cup may become one body and one spirit, a living sacrifice in Christ to the praise of your name. Remember, Lord, your one holy Catholic and apostolic church, redeemed by the blood of your Christ. Reveal its unity, guard its faith, and preserve it in peace. And grant that we may find our inheritance with the blessed Virgin Mary, with blessed Paul, with patriarchs, prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and all the saints who have found favor with you in ages past. We praise you in union with them and give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty God and Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, forever and ever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from gifts of God for the people of God.
Please join in the sending forth of our Eucharistic visitors on page 9 in the service bulletin. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and in this parish of St. Paul's, we send you forth bearing these holy gifts, that those to whom you go may share with us in the communion of Christ's body and blood. We who are many are one body, because we all share one bread, one cup. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now to the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. The God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.
Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Alleluia, alleluia.